morning, church. Uh, if you are visiting with us, my name is Todd. I got the privilege of being the lead pastor here. We're really glad that you are with us today. Uh, when I was a sophomore in high school, I decided to give the theater club a shot. <clears throat> I had a couple of friends who were in it. Uh, the girl I liked was in it. And so I thought, you know, why not? And and honestly, to my surprise, I was, I was, I was cast in, in the next play. At least I thought that I was cast in the next play. Uh, I w- uh, my name was there on the cast list, and there was, a, there was a role next to my name and everything. But it wasn't until after the, the first rehearsal that I realized that uh, it wasn't a real part. Uh, th- like there, there, the part had no lines, and it wasn't even in the script. Apparently, the theater director, uh, you know, she had enough uh, good actors to fill the actual roles, but you know, she 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 just kind of made up some parts for me and a couple of others because she liked us. She wanted us to participate, and she needed more people to like fill out the scenes. Well, if, if you haven't been with us for the last couple of weeks, we are, we're in a series of, of lessons called Follow Me, Lessons from the Lives of the Twelve. And we are, we're looking to, to, to different stories from, from Jesus' twelve disciples that teach us a little bit more about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And, and in four different places in the New Testament, we're given a list of these 12 disciples that all look fairly similar to this one in Matthew chapter 10. It says, these are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. We've, we've talked about each of those in a different week of this series. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. We talked about him. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Now, there are a few names in here that are, that are, that are well known, you know, like Peter, John, Judas Iscariot, for not great reasons. And then there are some others who, who are, they may have a smaller part in the biblical narrative, but they're memorable. Because, of, you know, someone like Matthew and what Jesus called him out of. Or, or someone like Thomas who has this, this moment of doubt and then profound belief that we're, we're going to talk about later on in this series. But there are also a few names in this cast list, if you'll let me, that, I mean, outside of these lists and, and our general understanding that they were there whenever it talks about all of the disciples being there, like, we just don't know much about them. Almost like they weren't, you know, real disciples. <laughs> they, were just, they were just names. They were just people that, that Jesus picked out to sort of fill out his scenes. But otherwise, like, we don't, we, we don't have, have a whole lot of their purpose given to us. The three, uh, the three in particular that sort of fit that bill are James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot. Between these three guys, like, we have one spoken phrase in the whole Bible. That's it. So why take any time on these three? Well, as my director would have said, there are no small parts, only small actors, which I think is kind of nonsense. But seriously, like, in a series of lessons about about our relationship with Jesus. What, what can we learn from three followers where we see almost no individual interaction with Jesus? And the answer is more than you might think. You know, many, many of us, we can, we can relate to someone like Peter whenever we, we read from the Bible because we get to see his, his ups and his downs. Or, or many of us have been, have been blessed by the words of someone like John who wrote a gospel. He wrote letters that ended up in the Bible. And, and there will be followers of Jesus in, in the church who, who have the opportunity to be, you know, well known for their leadership like Peter was. There will be, there will be followers of Jesus who write words like John in, in books and in songs that bless the whole church. And there will be many more of us as followers of Jesus who are like Thaddeus or Simon 
You know, maybe, maybe not the most visible of Jesus' followers, but people who still have a unique and purposeful part to play in, in God's family. You know, each of these disciples that we're going to talk about today, they each have a story. And even if we only get a glimpse of that story, it's enough to learn something more of who Jesus calls and the, and the meaning that is found for us in relationship with him. We might not know a whole lot about these three, and we ourselves may not be followers that much is ever known about. But in, in Matthew chapter 19, it says this about them. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said to them, he said to his 12 disciples, truly I tell you, in the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes, tribes of Israel, no matter how few words you had in the Bible that were written down. And, and then this is important for, for all of us, all of us who would call ourselves followers of Jesus, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields because of my name, anyone who has given something up, given up their, their home, given, given up their, their, their profession, given up worldly success, given up time with family, anyone who has given up anything for my name, Jesus says, will receive a hundred times more and will inherit eternal life. It's a big deal. So, because, because we are trying to take something away from each of the 12 disciples in this series, I want, us to, I want us to look at a few lessons that we can learn from what we do know of these three disciples individually. And then, because it's going to be kind of strands going in a few different directions, I'm going to see if I can pull those together into just one unifying lesson for any of us who would follow the call of Jesus in our own lives. We'll start out with James, the son of Alphaeus. So here's what we know about James. He was the son of Alpheus. And that's about it. <laughs> Actually, not, not, not exactly. He was called James the son of Alpheus to differentiate him from a couple of other Jameses that we have in the New Testament. Um, there was another James among the 12 disciples. He was James the son of Zebedee. We're actually going to talk about him next Sunday. And then uh, there, was, there was another James who was the half-brother of Jesus. He, we find out in the book of Acts, became a leader in the early church. And, and he's the one that we believe wrote the, the biblical book of James. So James, uh, the son of Alphaeus then, we actually do think he, he, he might get one other mention in Scripture outside of the list of disciples. And that's in Mark chapter 15, verse 40. This is near the, the end of, of Mark's gospel, his, his uh, recording of the, the ministry of Jesus, and it's, he's describing the events surrounding Jesus' crucifixion. And Mark tells us in, in verse 40, he said, there were also women watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and Salome. In Galilee, these women followed him, followed Jesus, and took care of him. Many other women had come up with him to Jerusalem. Kind of a side note, but if, if when you envision Jesus with his followers, if your thought is only like Jesus and these, these 12 guys, like it's, it is a much broader picture than that. You know, Jesus had many people who were following him, including many of these, these women who were, who were part of his group of followers also. And that phrase, okay, so it, it talks about Mary, the mother of James, the younger. That phrase, the younger, uh, it's actually a little tough of a translation. It might mean younger. It might mean by age. But clearly there's a, there's a comparison here. He's given this because there's a comparison with another James that Mark would have told us about, uh, the other James disciple. So either he was younger than him or it, it may actually be referring to his height. This could actually mean James the smaller. Or, or it could be a, a reference to his prominence, James the less, i.e. James the, the one we don't hear about as much as the other James. 
And if that's the case, then, then that's why we kind of think that this might be James, the son of Alphaeus. That's where people have landed historically. That's where people have landed modernly. And if that's true, then what that means is here we've got an early example of a mother and a son who were both devoted followers of Jesus. Now, I'm going to enter the realm of speculation here, but it wouldn't surprise me if maybe, maybe in this case or maybe in another, there, there wouldn't have been, you know, a, a mom who, who, who heard about and came to know Jesus and who wanted her son to come and get to experience that too. Just real quick show of hands, how, how many of you who are followers of Jesus here in the room would say that a family member played a significant part in you coming to follow Jesus? It's, it's, it's not that everybody who comes to Jesus comes to him through family relationships, but I mean, as long as you have influence in a family member's life, and, and I'll say especially parents, like parents, as long as you have the opportunity to influence your kids, keep, keep pushing them towards Jesus. Keep drawing them towards Jesus. Keep trying to help them get to know Jesus. We, we need moms and sons, Ma Marys and Jameses. We need dads and daughters following Jesus together. It may be, it may be the smallest of lessons that we can get from, from James, but it's important. His family's important following Jesus. All right, shifting gears, uh, let's talk about Thaddeus. Uh, now, this, this is the name, Thaddeus is the name that shows up in Matthew and Mark's list, but in his place, Luke mentions that there is a second disciple who was called James, um, or not James, the second disciple who was called Judas. Uh, Ju we have every reason to believe that these two are the same person because these names just kind of pop in and out, and it's possible that, you know, Whenever they were running with this group of guys, they decided, hey, it's going to be too hard if we've got two guys called Judas. So one of you has got to go by a nickname. And, and so, like, I don't know, Thaddeus drew the short straw, and he didn't get to go by Judas anymore. Uh, or maybe it was that, you know, after a certain bit of circumstances took place with one of those Judases, this one didn't want to go by that anymore. Uh, just like, you know, around the time of the American Revolution, probably not too many people wanted to keep going by Benedict. Right? So Thaddeus Judas, he's, he, he's actually the one of the three disciples that we're talking about today who actually does get a, a word into the Bible. And it's, it's just, it's just one, one phrase, one sentence that we have from him. And it's a question. It's a question that he asked Jesus during uh, the last meal that Jesus shared with his disciples before he died on the cross. Jesus is, is in the midst of this discourse where he is explaining about just, just what the experience is going to be for his disciples after he's gone and, and his continuing presence uh, with them and, and how God is going to be, be guiding them. And, and, and this is what happens here in John chapter 14, verse 21, as Jesus is sharing, he says, he says, the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I also will love him and will reveal myself to him. In verse 22, Judas, not Iscariot, <laughs> said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Like, how is it? How is it we're going to see you and, and, and the world around us isn't going to see you? And Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's what he just said. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. In other words, for, for, those, who, for those who love Jesus and for those who are who are, who are striving to live in the way that he instructs, and that's really important, those who are seeking to obey him, Jesus is going to show himself to us in ways that the rest of the world doesn't get to see. God is going to have a nearness to us, his presence in our lives in a special way for those who love him. Now, this, 
This happens when, you know, maybe, maybe you get yourself into a conversation with someone and, and you just don't have the right words to say and you feel as though God gives you what you need to talk to them about in that moment. You know, this happens whenever you are in a situation that should just have you overwhelmed with stress, but instead you find yourself overwhelmed with peace. It happens when you, you get an unexpected expense and you have no idea how you're going to cover it, and yet somehow provision arrives. It happens when you, you've maybe really been struggling all week long, and then you walk in to, to church service, and, and, and we end up talking from the Bible about the very thing that you have been wrestling with. Like, I promise, I do not have a network of spy balloons. This is God revealing himself to us. It's showing his nearness to us as his followers. Now, I don't want to turn, you know, Thaddeus' question, I don't want to turn it into more than it is. I mean, I'm not going to go write a book called The Question of Thaddeus and, and say that all believers need to, you know, need to ask Thaddeus' question every day in prayer. Lord, how will you reveal yourself to us? I mean, it worked for the prayer of Jabez. If you don't get that reference, it's like 20 years old. Um, but I will say that it's really interesting how this... This one-line wonder in Scripture. He asked Jesus about revealing himself, and Jesus talked about a closeness with him. And, and, and this shows us the, you know, the, the questions, the, the closeness with Jesus to ask him questions. It wasn't limited to the, to the Peters and the Johns of the group. It was all of his followers. Every one of them had access to Jesus to ask their questions and to get clarity. And, and Jesus' answer, even in this, is that, is that you're going you're gonna to see me working in your life, not just because you're a preacher who's drawn a large crowd, not because you're, you're a missionary who's, who's far away. It's going to be all of you who have access to me. If you love me, if you are keeping my commands, there's going to be a nearness that you get to experience. And that is good news. For every follower, like you and me. All right, the last but, but not least of our group here is Simon the Zealot. Now, Simon truly only makes the lists. But Simon also has maybe, maybe the most interesting label of anyone that we see following Jesus. According to the, the Jewish historian Josephus, who was writing in the first century around the time of the New Testament, uh, there, were, there were these three mainstream Jewish political slash religious groups. A couple of them you'd probably be really familiar with. There was the Pharisees, there were the Sadducees, and then there was another group called the Essenes. And these were like the, these were the three mainstream groups uh, for, for politics and for just kind of religious thought in their society. Then we're told that there was this fourth group that was not mainstream, and they were called the Zealots. Now, the Zealots kind of agreed in principle with the Pharisees on a lot of things. They, they you know, held to a very strict adherence to the Old Testament law, plus a bunch of, like, added laws and codes that weren't in the Old Testament. And, and they felt that that should be sort of like the governing principle of their society. But the Zealots took it further. They believed that, that the Jewish people should have no ruler except God. And so in order to accomplish that in their society, they participated in assassinations and violence, and ultimately they led a rebellion against the Roman Empire that did not end well for Israel. The Zealots, they, they, they had extreme politics and they were extreme in their methods of, of bringing about the political and religious society that they thought was right. And yet Simon the Zealot was a disciple of Jesus. Jesus, a man who taught that if someone strikes you on the cheek, you should turn your other and offer it to him. Jesus, who, who told his followers, you know what? Pay the taxes to Caesar that are owed to Caesar. I mean, from, from an ideological standpoint... 
It seems like a complete contradiction for a zealot to be a follower of Jesus. And yet here Simon was. And for any, I mean, for any number of possible reasons, and we, we don't know what it was or what they were, Simon's allegiance to Jesus was more important than his allegiance to his political or, or philosophical ideologies. Now, I'm not saying that he completely gave up all of his political convictions. I'm not saying that he stopped wanting to see his society governed in a better way. I, he probably held on to some of that stuff. I, honestly, it's, it's my working theory that the reason we don't have anything recorded from Simon the Zealot in Scripture is because he just was like always talking about politics and his buddies did what we all do with our friend who's just always talking about politics, just kind of start tuning him out. I thought that was funny. Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't, I, I'm not saying that this disappeared from his life, but, but Jesus won out. I mean, when, and, and where, his, where his former beliefs, where they contradicted the teachings of Jesus, he followed Jesus. You know, I, our society encourages our politics, our ideologies to define us and divide us. But when we come to Jesus, when you experience the grace that he offers for everything that you ever have ever done and realize that that is for everyone. When, when we receive his guidance, learn that living in his ways is our way of bringing his heavenly kingdom to earth, it's got to win out. Our worldly philosophies, all of them get filtered in light of that and they get dropped where they where they are incompatible with the gospel. Simon, Simon may have been known as the zealot, but he isn't remembered because he was a really good zealot. He's remembered because he was a disciple of Jesus. And likewise, we, I mean, we should strive to be known not so much for our politics or our philosophies, but for our commitment to the saving message of Jesus. So these are three strands that kind of shoot off in very different directions, you know, family and, and Jesus' closeness to us and, and, and our, our beliefs before we come to him. I want to try and pull all of that together by saying that our, our backgrounds and our experiences, you know, our, our families, our, our talents and abilities or lack thereof, our introvertedness, our extrovertedness, none of those things keeps Jesus from calling us. He died to save people from every tribe and tongue. He died to save people from every socioeconomic background, every skill set, every Enneagram number, every disc profile. Je Jesus died to save so many. Th th I mean, there's no one right kind of person. No one right kind of person that he calls to follow him. No one right kind of person that you've got to figure out how to be after you follow him, other than one that is just pursuing him with all of your heart. If there's one big takeaway that I, I would hope that we could see from, from the presence of James and, and Thaddeus and Simon, along with all of his disciples, it is just the wide variety of, of backgrounds and, and personalities and experiences that, that all came together in their call to follow Jesus. And I believe that this is important for each one of us in our spiritual walks, both for our personal growth and for what, what God would, would have us bring to our churches, bring to the kingdom work that, that he is doing. I believe that we need to consider our 
distinctiveness as it relates to our walk with Jesus. But the question I would ask is, is, have you ever considered why Jesus called you? First and foremost, and I, I want to be really clear about this. Jesus calls us because he loves us and because we need him. I, 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 don't want anybody, I don't want anybody thinking that I am saying that this is all about like, oh, this is, it's, it, Jesus called me because of how great I am or because of what I brought to the table. Absolutely not. It's his love and our need first and, and, and foremost. But Jesus called you and you've responded. Many of us have responded. And now we're here, and, and, and we don't come with, with just a blank slate of our personhood. We, we come to him with, with our experiences. We come to him with our abilities. We come with our resources. We come with our personality. On top of that, we, we also receive the Holy Spirit to empower us into living as Jesus would have us live. And, and maybe, you've, maybe you've thought before that, man, I... Jesus can use other kind of Christians, you know. Yeah, if I, could, if I could speak like them or if I could sing like them or if I could pray like that person, you know, if I, if I was as smart as they were, if I, was, if I was young like they are, if I was older like they are, like if I, if I had more to bring, then Jesus could use me, but not somebody like me. But look at his disciples. Jesus was not looking for one kind of follower. He calls all kinds. He grows all kinds. He uses all kinds. Some with, because of their experiences in life or because of their personalities or because of their, their abilities, that, that, that he can do things through you that maybe wouldn't happen if you weren't here. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says that he came so that we could have life and life to the full. Now, that, that starts, that life starts with his death on a cross for us and his, his resurrection to, to free us from the bonds of death. And that life, it, it ends with eternal life. So it doesn't really end, it just goes on forever. But if those are like the, the bookends to it, then whenever he says, I want you to have life and life to the full, that means there's this big middle section in the here and now. He wants us to, to live a, a purposeful life, us specifically as the unique individual that is now a part of his family. I believe that it is important for all of us as followers of Jesus to spend time considering what is it about us that, that he is calling to be a part of what he's doing. So here's something I have to offer our church. If you, are, if you are here on vacation for a week, I don't know, t tell your church that, that you thought that this was a good idea and, the, and that you think they should do it too. But I, I, if, you're, if you're here with us, um, I want to invite you to something. Uh, Ross Thompson and I, Ross is, Ross is one of our elders, our church elders, and you see him up here closing services from time to time. Uh, Ross is a professional counselor, and he and I, we've just been, we've just been cooking something up for our church family we're calling it the, the G3 Workshop, Finding Fulfillment in God's Given Gifts. That's the three Gs. <laughs> this, this is just going to be an, an intentional time for us as a church family to work through what, some of what God has, has brought to the table in us and, and how he's working in us as, as unique followers of his and, and, and how we might better leverage that for a, a more fulfilling and a more purposeful walk with Christ. We're going to do this on Sunday, March the 26th. It's going to be from 12 to 2, so it's going to be after our second service. And this is for anybody. This is for anybody ages 11 to 105. I don't think we have anybody older than that in our church, but if we do, you can come too. Um, we're, whether you've been following Jesus for five minutes, whether you've been following him for 50 years, this is for anybody who wants to explore kind of God's wiring in you, his working in you up to this point, wants to understand that better and understand how you might, how you might live that out for a more fulfilling and, and purposeful walk. What we're going to do is we're going to have, we're going to have some lunch together. We're going to have child care if, there, if there's a need. If people need child care for this event, we'll have it. Um, it's just going to be an interactive time. It's going to be led by myself, led by Ross. And, and we want to help, help anybody who wants to be a part of this, see where God is kind of at work in your uniqueness. 
So if you're, if you're interested in coming to this event, we would love to have you register for that. Uh, you can do that electronically. That will help us a ton because it will help us know what to plan on for food and for child care. Uh, you can do that on our website, either just watch it as the scrolling thing goes by, you'll find it, or if you uh, want to click on our events page, you can find it there too. We got a table out in the lobby where we, you can just snap a picture of a, of a QR code and it'll open you up to, the, to the, uh, the, the site where you can get registered for that. If you absolutely are incapable of signing up for something electronically, see us at the table, we will help you out. I know that I know that from, you know, from, from a message like this, when we're, when we're talking about, you know, we're trying to talk about different disciples and, you know, ones that we don't know very much about at that. And it, can, it can feel a little bit like a, like a catch-all day, like just, just grabbing at strands and trying to pull them together. But as I was, I don't know, kind of stressing on that a little bit for this week's message, God just reminded me that, hey, as the church, we're kind of a catch-all group. Like, it's amazing who, who Jesus pulls together to, to, to make his church. And, and he, he died to save the, the loud and the quiet. He died for, for those who've got a million questions and for those who just have one. He, he died for, for those who are going to stand out and for those who are going to blend in. He, he, died for, he died for those who are brought by family and who are brought by friends and for those who come on their own. He died for the wealthy and the poor, for the men and the women, for the young and the old, people from every skin color, from every political party, every social class, every skill set. There's a place in God's family for us to belong, and not just to belong, but to have a purpose and to make an impact. And as Jesus said to, to Thaddeus, if we, if we love him, if we keep his word, he reveals himself to us. He makes his home in us, and he works in each one of us uniquely as we are. For his glory and for our good. And I want to invite you into a deeper discovery of the way that Jesus is working in you. Would you pray with me? Father God, we want to give you thanks for being our God. You are our Father in heaven and your name is to be kept holy. Lord, we thank you for this time where we have to gather together as your church. Lord, as this group of people that you have called to follow you, and you have called us out of so many unique backgrounds and personalities and situations, Lord God. And, and we thank you, Lord that, Lord, that you would save a wretch like me. Lord, I, I pray that, that we would be a people who would long to see you at work in our lives. That, Lord, that, that we wouldn't think that, that the, the Christians you can use are, are somebody else. But, Lord, that we would, we would see that when you call, when you draw us in, Lord, that, that there is a purpose for us. That there is an impact to be made through you in our lives. And, and Lord, I pray that we would be a people who seek after that. I thank you, Lord, for the for the James, son of Alphaeuses, for the Thaddeuses, for the Simon, the Zealots, and for, Lord, even just a glimpse of, of their lives and, and Lord, why the, 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 their place is in Scripture, Lord. And, and for so much that we don't know about them, to know that, Lord, you used them, you worked in them, Lord, that you have, you have prepared a heavenly place, Lord, for them, and that you have, Lord, that same just love and compassion for and, and reward waiting for all of us who would turn our lives over to you and seek to follow you. I pray that that would be our heart. I pray that we would seek after you more and that in the power of your spirit, Lord, we would just learn more and more how you have created us, how you have molded us, how you are gifting us, Lord, for your glory and really for our good. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for dying on a cross for us. 
us as a group, us as specific individuals, that you knew us, you knew all that we had done, you went to that cross for us anyway. You went to our cross because of, because you love us. And we pray all of these things in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.